professor uh, deshpande or uh, professor sarkar uh, i mean yeah uh, i will start yeah sure please uh, so, uh, Anand, should I speak for uh, 10, 15 minutes? Will that be all right? Yes, yes, ma'am. Because uh, because Professor Sarkar intends to have some presentation, and he is also oh. uh, around 15 to 20 minutes. So, whatever is okay. fine for you. Yeah. Okay. No, thanks, uh, everyone, for inviting me uh, today, and uh, especially considering the fact that uh, I'm not really an UP uh, expert uh, like Nilanjan uh, or many other colleagues. Uh, and uh, I thought uh, as a student of Indian democracy, uh, perhaps uh, I must share some of my thoughts uh, related to uh, the situation in UP, but also beyond that uh, on this uh, occasion. Uh, and uh, another kind of temptation for me was that uh, all these discussions, uh, I mean, I definitely appreciate the fact that students have organized it and I thought that I must participate because it's a student's initiative. But also because of the fact that most of these discussions, although we are talking about a, in quotes, backward state like Uttar Pradesh, uh, many of the dis our discussions remain Delhi-centric. And the scholars from periphery like Pune or other places uh, are, are not really part of it. So I thought that I may use this opportunity uh, to talk to Delhiites. Um, I think although today's discussion is mainly about UP and also in the context of uh, the elections, the upcoming elections uh, scheduled in 2022, um, I thought that still there are three issues that we implicitly sort of discuss, want to discuss uh, around uh, the, the patterns of Dalit vote in, in UP. Um, one is what is the nature of Dalit vote there so far and uh, what can be what what can we uh, how how what can we generalize on around it? The other uh, issue is about the overall nature of Dalit politics, which has deep connections with the way in which uh, Dalit uh, citizens have been voting uh, in elections. And uh, and finally, uh, I thought that it is also implicitly there the the context of Dalit politics, which is really the context of Indian democracy that we are talking about. Uh, and I, of course, I am not going to speak much on that part, at least in the initial presentation uh, or initial this um, uh, sharing with you. But maybe perhaps we can take up those issues about Indian democracy and the connection between the Dalit politics and in the context in which it has to operate uh, at some level uh, in our, during our discussion. Uh, so in, in, in the course of discussion, we may touch upon some of these issues. Uh, so first of all, I would like to share a few things uh, related to the nature of Dalit vote, particularly more particularly in UP, uh, but also generally at the All India level and in different states. And as you know, I have been associated with, uh, some of you might know, I'm sorry, some of you might know that I have been associated with what we call as the national election studies, which are conducted by the Lokniti group. Uh, located at Center for Study of Developing Societies in Delhi. So Lokniti Network has been studying the nature patterns of vote generally, and also therefore patterns of Dalit vote uh, uh, at the All India level, as well as in various assembly elections uh, that have taken place back since 1971, if I may go back to the first generation of NES. But there is a kind of time series, a data on time series, a timeline da uh, data on timeline uh, regarding the nature of vote um, of Dalits. And uh, two of my colleagues actually have already written extensively uh, on this issue. So I'm going to uh, use their insights, of course, uh, in presenting this these couple of points before you. Uh, Professor Suhas Parashikar has written um, on the pattern nature of Dalit vote uh, in different Indian elections uh, long back, uh, a, a few years ago. And also uh, Rahul Verma, who's a colleague uh, with Nilanjan also, of course, uh, and, and he's been working with Nilanjan on various projects. So Rahul uh, has also written um, a, a, a piece where he analyzes uh, the pattern of Dalit vote uh, in uh, the Lok Sabha elections, mainly using the data for Lok Sabha elections. And there is, of course, uh, a repository of assembly election data also with the Lokniti, 
but uh, I, I don't think I would be able to present all that data and I don't have access also to all that data at the moment. But uh, uh, on the basis of the NES data, the broad trends that have emerged so far uh, regarding the nature of Dalit vote uh, in the Indian context, I will just initially share those with you. Uh, one is that, and the, both these colleagues begin with this, uh, begin with this kind of a critique of the idea of reducing uh, the voting in Indian elections to mere uh, political sociology, uh, reducing politics to sociology. Uh, that is what I mean by that is the sense that we tend to often, um, often explain the nature of vote and often explain the overall nature of politics in terms of certain social cleavages. And so we sort of collapse politics into social categories, um, more specifically into caste categories at the moment, uh, since we are talking about the nature of Dalit vote. But there is this tendency to reduce politics to certain social cleavages. And uh, both these colleagues uh, have criticized that idea. And I completely share, I agree with their criticism in the sense that uh, we cannot understand politics in general and more part particularly the electoral politics uh, only in terms of social cleavages. So in terms of caste-based vote banks as far as Dalit vote is concerned. And so the, uh, and this is a very important insight I think uh, for our discussions also because if we try and reduce politics to sociology, if we try and reduce politics the nature of the, the elections to certain social cleavages. And in case of UP and Bihar, it is always very much possible and in this in discussion. Uh, it is the dominant way, uh, dominant uh, ways of discussion. But if we do that, uh, I think that we are actually essentially negating the dynamics of democracy because democracy is supposed to moderate these social cleavages. And uh, we, we see democratic system, we have invested a lot in democratic system over the past 70, 75 years, essentially with this consideration, essentially with this background that democracy provides this essential dynamic to change or, or alter the social cleavages. And we see that the alterations in social cleavages. So it would not be a good idea, definitely, to think about the Dalit vote or to think about, let us say, uh, women's vote or to think about um, the urban or rural vote, essentially in terms of uh, social cleavages, is especially in terms of ascriptive identities, and that is not the case. So the, the NES data uh, and the analysis of Dalit vote so far uh, suggests, I guess, three things. And I'm just going to discuss those shortly. Very, uh, I'm just going to flag off those um, shortly for your consideration. One is that uh, this data suggests that there is no Dalit Wood Bank uh, existing both at the national level, but also as well as at the state level. Uh, and uh, in fact, in every election, we see a very dynamic process of uh, voting uh, of the Dalits and other social groups. Uh, so uh, the Dalit Wood Bank doesn't exist. And instead, uh, voting by any particular social group becomes a very complex exercise. And that, there is a lot of literature uh, on that as well for those of you who are interested, but how uh, the, 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 the decision to vote in Indian elections especially becomes a very, and in other elections also in the US election and other, at other places, but the, dis, the decision to vote, how it becomes a very complex decision for any uh, voter, um, and her, how her choices are decided in a very complex way. And therefore the explanations of uh, voting also need to be more complicated in nature and essentially plural in nature. That is something that scholars have discussed at length. And I guess uh, the point about non-existence of Dalit vote banks, both at the national as well as state level uh, should be taken into consideration as a very important starting point. Of course, the other colleagues have shown that the same is the case with Muslim vote bank. Of course, uh, Pro Professor Hilal Ahmed, for example, he's discussed it an, a lot. Uh, uh, or uh, we, we may say that in my own work, the nature of women's vote, I have tried to complicate the nature of women's vote in Indian politics in a similar way. Uh, so uh, that, would be, uh, that would be a very important uh, 
uh, inside empirical insight i would say because uh, it, it 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 comes from the empirical data that uh, we we get um, access to the other uh, gen, sort, sort sort of a general point that emerges a, a trend that emerges or a conclusion that emerges from the nes data is that uh, there is a puncturing of this caste blocks uh, both in terms of the upper castes uh, the the obcs as well as the dalits you know the whole process of mandalization and the, the whole project of mandalization in a way imagined existence of certain caste blocks and of course the project of mandalization because of its because of the inherent anti caste discourse in it also imagine a certain kind of ideological unity between the dalits and the bahujans between the dalits and the other obcs and we know that for various uh, socio economic as well as structural reasons uh, this unity uh, hasn't been possible Uh, at various levels we will come back to that point if you want during the discussion but the point is that the dalit vote gives us a clear indication of this fact how caste blocks uh, are disintegrating in the post mandal period and instead we see emergence of a single caste identity and consolidation of a single caste identity uh, intra dalit as well as it, uh, this is true of other social groups as well but more particularly since we are talking about the dalit politics here and especially in the context of up uh, we know that uh, rather than caste block emergence of caste blocks uh, a caste block as that of dalits we see uh, emergence of single caste identities um, of course it has very significant implications for the dalit politics if we want to talk about that uh, later in the later part of the discussion the way in which uh, it also reflects on the, the the way in which the whole politics of social justice was so to say again at various levels uh, strategically hijacked or emptied of its content and this is one kind of a, a one kind of an uh, kind of an implication of that or it corroborates with that and the more, the third thing and i will perhaps stop after that uh, anant uh, if you permit Uh, so the third thing that i wanted to share with you are the actual voting patterns and how the dalits have voted both at the all, all india level and at in in up um, maybe nilanjan would have more details about it but uh, as far as the nes data is concerned it seems that up to 2009 I mean if we go back in history generally up to 2009 uh, the congress uh, had a major chunk of the dalits vote dalit votes at the all india level and uh, at least to a certain extent a certain part of the up history uh, congress had uh, uh, congress had benefits of a dalit vote but in and this was uh, but still the congress has uh, the, the percentage of dalit support or the extent of dalit support for the congress both at the national level as well as in up considerably of course reduced between 1971 to 2009 because uh, in 1971 40% of the dalits at all india level had voted for the congress but that percentage come down, comes down to 25% and then i quickly checked the 2014 and 2019 data as well uh, whatever i could um, uh, could access and there the percentage has further decline but this is very obvious i mean we need not contest that uh, till 2009 the bjp Uh, had a sort of support of around 10% of the dalits and that support increases as you know in 2014 as well as uh, in uh, 2019 so uh, in 2000 uh, in, in 2014 the nda gets 28% of the dalit votes at the all india level and in 2019 it gets 40% of the dalit votes at uh, the all india level um of course we are interested in bsp uh, since we are discussing up so in when, since its emergence in 1996 uh, roughly 10% votes at the all india level and so bsp becomes a very important uh, point of discussion for our discussion of up and it rises up to 20% in 2009 but again in 2014 and 19 
uh, the BSP uh, support among Dalits at the national level and therefore also at the U at the level of uh, UP, the state level, declines a little bit, uh, de declines considerably. And 2014 BSP gets 12% of the Dalit votes at the All India level and 2019, 11%. So there is a declining graph, both for the Congress as well as BSP. Uh, in UP in particular, if we go to the details of uh, BSP vote, uh, it gets, yeah, it gets sizable support in UP. It is still able to retain its sizable support, but it comes, and that is something that I thought is interesting for our discussions about the disintegration of caste blocks and our whole, the, a commentary on the project of Mandal. Um, in 2014, 57% of the BSP voters, those who had voted for BSP, they come from the Jatav community. And in 2019, again, uh, almost, uh, yeah, 22% of the, there, there is a change in the BSP support between 2014 and 2019. And now in 2019 uh, Lok Sabha elections, the BSP gets support from Dalits as well as the upper OBCs. So there is a combination of these two, so to say, caste groups uh, in as far as the BSP support is concerned. Uh, so in UP, it still gets a sizable chunk of Dalit votes, but at the same time, it also gets a sizable, its support comes from both Dalits as well as upper OBCs. So this, 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 this uh, issue of creation, essential creation of numerical majorities, which perhaps again we may address during the course of discussion, um, uh, is, is becomes an important point uh, for uh, this discussion. And the third and the last point regarding the nature of vote at the All India level, as well as in UP that I would like to share with you, is the, is the category of other parties, you know, where Dalits at the All India level vote in a large, uh, chunk to other parties, and that is not the case confined to Dalits. In fact, uh, as Rahul had has has very um, candidly said that the, the Dalit vote we we don't find any different pattern of Dalit vote compared to other social communities, or more generally the overall pattern of voting in Indian elections. And uh, voters move from this to that party, and voters have various considerations while voting. Uh, throughout, uh, if we look at the electoral history so far. So uh, there you will find that many, especially since the 1990s, many social groups and many citizens, many voters have voted for other political parties, the non-national, so to say, regional political parties. But we see a considerable uh, chunk of Dalits, a considerable percentage share of Dalits also voting for these other parties. And that percentage, uh, that share remains intact um, in 2014 and 2019 also indicating a kind of dispersal uh, of the Dalit vote compared to consolidation of certain other, uh, consol consolidation of vote of certain other communities, like for example, the Hindus or the upper castes, etc. Okay, so I thought that this point also must be taken into consideration as a very important point uh, for our discussion. Um, then, uh, we may talk about its implications, the kind of Dalit vote, uh, the pattern that of Dalit vote that we discussed, what are its implications for the Dalit politics um, and uh, for uh, the politics of UP. I thought we will discuss those in the, in the later course of discussion, but I'll just once again flag off two points and there I'll stop. One is that it clearly the, the pattern of Dalit vote shows, and this is not something new, it's very obvious, but how it arrests the journey of the BSP as essentially a party representing the Dalits, not only in electoral politics, but also in mobilizational politics and also in terms of assertion of Dalit agency. So what happens to BSP and what would be its implications, etc. And the other is regarding the nature of Dalit politics. I mean, it, ha it has certain compulsions um, of, um, of uh, engagement with formal power. And these compulsions, we know that they dominated the politics of UP as well for a long time. The compulsions to share formal power and be part of formal power, and which are very essential uh, compulsions, uh, if you ask me. But at the same time, we do not see 
such compulsions or such pressures uh, present in uh, essentially those parts of the country uh, including up the entire belt which which moves from or which goes from west bengal to including up to haryana and maybe punjab this entire belt we do not see uh, effective interventions dalit interventions or uh, effective uh, political interventions electoral electorally important interventions because we don't see any presence of uh, dalit politics or dalit parties uh, in this entire belt where a large part of the dalit population indian dalit population resides so what are the implications of, of this situation on dalit politics per se uh, and the larger interests of the dalits perhaps we can take those up uh, for discussion later on thank you thank you so much ma'am uh, may i then request professor sarkar to uh, uh, begin his remarks uh, <clears throat> so uh, thank you for inviting me thank you so much so, Wonderful to be on a panel with uh, Rajeshwari Deshpande uh, once again. We've we've been on um, another sort of event recently, and uh, you know, I'm somebody who knows probably much more about these issues than than I do. So um, I am not somebody who specializes in the study of Dalit politics in India as such. Um, uh, I I do study electoral politics, voting behavior. um uh, and other dimensions of democratic behavior or lack of democratic behavior as it might be um but uh i do you know uh, you know want to sort of put in context sort of that's going to be the the lens through which i'm going to be uh giving comments so i i made sort of a short um presentation just pulling from some other work that i have done um you know in a former life i spent much more time uh being much you know sort of doing very close electoral analyses of state elections in india and um you know i i have spent a lot of time in up particularly around the 2017 election so i want to spend a little bit of time talking about what i saw in 2017 that can perhaps help us think a little bit about dalits in up um and you know what uh, and and also put in context uh what the dalit communities are facing in up vis-a-vis -vis what other communities are also facing in up right so putting things in a more holistic from a uh, in a more holistic standpoint so let me just quickly share my screen here okay um all of you can see my screen yes sir yeah okay great um so as i said i want to sort of very briefly talk about the 2017 election and also um you know i've added just quickly as as professor deshpande was 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 speaking i've i've added a couple of slides which i think uh, bolster her point right i mean uh, i i'm very much from the same school of thought um as her when it comes to sort of over determined so, uh, political sociology theories um and thinking about elections the sheer volatility we have in indian elections tells you that politics is not as fixed as uh, just the politics of our identities and who we may or may not be voting for okay so i want to start with you know 2017 uh, election results this is a map that many of you know it is out of the 403 seats um it is a sweep right for the bjp right uh, well over 300 seats the bjp has won in every corner of the country uh, in every uh, corner of the country in the national election in every corner of the state in 2017 and uh you know this is what we have to grapple with when we think about the state of play so any time we think about what is the position let's say of the muslim community or of dalit communities in up this is the world that we're facing right now that when, when we think about um you know electoral prospects electoral behavior of dalits but also other social behavior now what i've done here very quickly is broken down so the 2017 election was a seven phase election right so people voted uh, over seven periods and i have broken down how the bjp had performed in uh, the 2014 national election as you know uh, the bjp swept 
Um, out of the 80 seats, 71 by BJP and two by allies. So 73 out of the 80 seats, parliamentary seats were won in 2014. Um, so looking at the strike rate, the proportion of seats the BJP won as a function of the ones they contested in the 2014 election when they swept and in the 2017 election when they swept. And what you can see is that it is almost a, 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 a direct map uh, you know, in the first five phases, there's little difference. Uh, the same party, the way that it performed under Modi in 2014 is how it performs under Yogi Adityanath in 2017. We do see, interestingly, some differences in the last two phases. Um, these, in, these phases actually include Gorakhpur and uh, Varanasi. So these are supposedly where Modi and, and, and Yogi Adityanath should be the strongest, but this actually is the one place where we see that Actually, the 2017 performance, while still high, I mean, strike rates of 80 and 67% are nothing to, 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 to laugh about, lower than the sort of spectacular performance that they would have had in the 2014 national election. So this is just sort of a way of sort of thinking a little bit about um, regionally sort of how the BJP had performed, but also that the kinds of numbers that we're associating with, with the BJP uh, in the national election are very similar to the kind of numbers that we're associating for the BJP in the state election. Right? And that has certain implications because it tells us about the kind of politics that is in play, right? So if we think about a politics in UP, when we often talk about the way that certain parties perform, the Samadwadi party, the BSP, this is a stronghold, that's a weak area, this is Yadav dominated, that is Jatav, right? That is something that is very local, right? Very context. The fact that a state election is having patterns of elect electability that looks very much like a national election is a big shift, right? And it's something that we need to sort of start thinking about when we talk about UP. So I want to sort of give some sense of, um, you know, sort of abstractly what I'm going to argue is this vision. Of, 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 of what BJP politics is, right? And, and why it has come to be so dominant in the context of UP and how it relates to the Dalit communities. As I, you notice, I've been using plurals because I will, I will refer to the Jatav community as different than the non-Jatav community uh, quite uh, regularly in the analysis because the, the political behavior is quite different. Um, but also, um, you know, this gives us some perspective on how a certain kind of politics, and this is why I said, you know, when I say that I'm uh, very much thinking along the same lines as Professor Deshpande, um, a certain kind of politics in some sense um, no longer plays well in a state like UP, which is somewhat surprising. Right? And so here's one way of thinking about um, theoretically what the challenge is. So let's take a very stylized model of what people associate with, and I would agree that their political, the politics was more complicated than this, but um, that people associate with what the BSP and the SP have done in Uttar Pradesh. So the stereotypical view is, for instance, for the Samadhi Party, the Y plus M alliance, Yadavs plus Muslims. These are communities that in various ways I cater to either with economic benefits or security benefits and so on and so forth. And in turn, they vote for me, right? A similar argument is made about BSP, right? With initially, it was just about, it was about all Dalits. Now there's a view of a split within the Dalit community between the Jata community and the non Jata community, which are also geographically dispersed in, in, in various ways, right? Now, what I want to sort of bring to the fore here, right? I've just, so the Yadav number is not available from the census. We do not collect data on separate jatis that are publicly available in the Indian census. But the 2011 Indian census does allow us to estimate the proportion of the other communities across UP, right? Now, what you can see, maybe the Yadavs are a little bit higher, maybe there's a miscount in the Muslim community, Dalit community, so on and so forth. But broadly, we're talking about a population that as a whole numbers less than 50% of the total UP population. And that is being split between two parties, right? So when we uh, 
when we conceive of the performance of the uh, BSP and the SP, one thing that is sort of interesting about our analytical conception is that we're never even talking about more than 50% of the population of the state. And that obviously creates a certain electoral incentive if there is a political force or a political party that can join these actors together um, against perhaps some of these other, the, some of the groups I've listed here, then, uh, then, then, then uh, the electoral fortunes of a certain kind of politics are, are, are diminished. I want to talk about some other things that we've been seeing in, in UP since, uh, since the rise of Modi, Amit Shah, that version of the BJP. So one thing that had been a common feature of uh, UP politics pre-2017 is that somewhere around a fifth to a quarter of the vote share would be going to independent candidates, other small parties that were not sort of um, you know, the big four and the big four, and you can argue what my big four is, but you know, I think whether they should all be considered big, but BJP, Congress, BSP, SP, right? These four. So all I've done is I've just added up the vote shares, the aggregate vote shares of these parties. And you see a striking trend, right? By the time we're in 2017, um, a large amount of that independent and small party vote share has been sucked up. It's actually largely been sucked up by the BJP. So uh, some of my other work, which has looked at national elections, right, has talked about how um, those voters who were not aligned to any political party that were not turning out in, in the context of national elections systematically came out for the BJP. And I think that we need to sort of understand this kind of coalition as not just sort of winning over groups that were already active in the UP political system, but also those that felt like they didn't have a part or a stake in the existing UP system. Mm -hmm. So when we think about how the Dalits fit into UP politics, we have to figure out how the Dalit communities fig figure in within these other communities that we don't always sort of count. As I said, the, almost all the communities we talk about number less than 50% of the population. Um, so I want to just, you know, this is sort of a, a simple statistic, right, which is that, um, you know, when we look at areas of UP that have less than 40% Muslim population, the BJP strike rate is higher. Um, now, what is interesting is that when we uh, take a sort of, this is something very, very complicated as statistical model, something, uh, you know, called the regression spline, but uh, the red curve here corresponds to uh, the BJP performance in 2014 and the blue is 2017. Both, uh, both versions say the same thing, which is that once we start getting into an area where the Muslim community is sort of of moderate size, that's when the BJP's probability of winning is the highest, right? It's a polarization effect. If there aren't that many Muslims to organize against, the feeling for the BJP is less, if there is a very, very large Muslim population, the kind of political polarization doesn't work in your favor, right? With the Jakov communities, right, we see that it is not, you are not seeing that kind of polarization. It is true that the BJP does best when uh, the Jakov population is low, but it still does reasonably well, even at moderate levels of, uh, of Jakov uh, population. It's only when it gets really high, that's where the BSP is doing well, that you see a significant drop in the BJP's performance, right? So this again gives us some sense that, uh, you know, people are strategic voters, right? If the competitive parties in my constituency are not the BSP, if I'm choosing between the BA, BJP and the SP, let's say, then as a Dalit voter, am I voting for the BSP still? Am I voting for a Dalit party still? Or am I voting for one of the two major parties in the constituency? So, um, so this is the kind of sort of electoral dynamics that we're seeing. And this, you know, obviously corresponds to the, the data that Professor Dishpande has, has, has also given you. Okay, so I'm just going to finish up fairly quickly. I know that I'm, I'm running a bit short on time. So um, this is just 
um, a, a, a bar chart version of the exact same phenomena they've shown you. I've taken the 2012 state election, 2014 national election, 2017 state election, and showed you again, it is where the uh, where it is that uh, the Muslims are of moderate size, that is where the BJP has its highest strike rate, right? Where it's most, mo most electorally competitive. Um, and similarly, if we take the population that is neither Dalit nor Muslim, right? So OBC is plus general caste, right? This is something we can pull out from the census. Then indeed it is true that where there are no Dalits and where there are no Muslims, the BJP is performing better almost linearly, right? So I want to end now with a couple of things. I want to talk about um, something that uh, you know was was talked about at length by Professor Deshpande, which is electoral volatility um, and the extent of a floating vote. And um, so this is some work that was done by Pradeep Shiver and Irfan Nuruddin. Um, we don't need to worry too much about what the measures are about electoral volatility. Mean electoral volatility basically takes the average change in vote share uh, across all parties in a system. Now, if you were in a consolidated Western democracy, so to speak, today the US is presidential elections, you will see the actual percentages from 2016 to 2012 to 2020 are maybe moving two or three percentage points. In India, they move 30 percentage points, 20 percentage points, 15 percentage points, right? If we think of a state like Tamil Nadu, which is just boom and bust, or for many years was, or Kerala, right? Boom and bust for one state, right? For one party or the other. So you have uh, elections which have extraordinary levels of electoral volatility in a comparative sense, right? And if our theory is about the fixity of caste and religion and who you vote for, then how would you explain this kind of electoral volatility, right? And, um, you know, this is something that I've, I, I've sort of mentioned in a number of places. Now, what I want to now suggest, and then I want to end with this, right, um, is that it's not that our metrics in our head are wrong. But saying that somebody is more likely to vote for one party is not the same thing as saying that somebody is definitely going to vote for another party. And let me show you how things can go horribly off. Now, this is some data that I have from the 2014 national election a survey that I was involved in. Right. Now, it is always true. This is looking at 2009 national data and 2014 national data. Right, so national elections. Now it is always true that upper castes are more likely to vote for the NDA than the OBCs and the SCs, right? But look at the shifts between uh, 2009 and 2014 for voting for the BJP or NDA, right? In every community, there's a large shift towards the BJP. So simply making the statement that being from a particular community makes you much more likely to vote for a uh, a political party does not explain all of the electoral dynamics because when you are seeing these kinds of shifts within larger caste categories, I admit, but if you do smaller caste categories, you'll see the same thing. Um, it doesn't take seriously the amount of floating vote within each community, right? So even if it is likely the Yadavs are more likely to vote for the Samajwadi party, it doesn't mean that a significant proportion of the Yadavs are not voting for other parties. And when you go to the ground, or when you are a reporter, if the population of Yadavs voting for the uh, BJP goes from 80% to 65%, right? That's something that'll be almost imperceptible to you in interviews. How many people would you have to meet to be able to pick up those kinds of numbers? But actually in terms of vote share, that will be a huge shift in all, all across UP, right? So, um, you know, I think it is important for us to sort of understand that there is that kind of um, ethnic dynamic, right, and floating dynamic when it comes to electoral politics. In UK, right? Okay, so what I'm going to do here is just sort of tie the sort of larger view of, of, of caste politics. So as you can see that I've tried to sort of weave together how the Dalit uh, vote is associated with all of these other things. Let me just end with some pieces that I would, I'd written around the 2017 election. Um, 
and just tell you a little bit, uh, you know, about sort of, you know, how I think about some of some, some of these books. So I'm going to just read a couple of bits and pieces from from this uh, piece that I'd written. Um, it was in in the Hindu at that time I was writing for. Um, in Farukhabad, um, we, next to a bridge over the Ganges, we meet a small shop owner from the OBC Loth caste. As you know, they are um, not uh, they're not Dalits; they're they're, they're OBCs. Um, who complains? Hamari ginti nahi We're never counted. Bemoaning the fact that his community is not explicitly counted in the caste and religi uh, religious arithmetic of the SP and the BSP. He says, we need someone like Narendra Modi who is with all castes. Now I sort of end the piece with um, thinking about, um, you know, how politics has changed. A political campaign that started out with larger debates about development, law and order has reverted to the same bald faced caste religious arithmetic that has characterized UP politics for decades. But the arithmetic is driven by the exact opposite phenomenon as the 1990s, a desire to remove caste and religion as the basis for economic distribution, rather than the explicit assertion of it, as in the 1990s. It's a stark reminder that politics has a way of eventually catching up with political science. While Jatavs, Muslims, and Yadavs are numerically large groups, even combined, they are far from a majority of the population of UP, and these groups largely split their support between two parties. In the long run of party logic that only distributes to a small defined uh, small fraction of the population cannot sustain the broad coalitions across caste and religion required to win elections. It's a principle that is showing its uh, teeth at a most inconvenient time for the sum of the party. Now, I want to sort of now sort of take this back in this last 30 seconds. Like, what does this tell us about Dalit politics? What does this tell us about Chandrasekhar Azad? What does this take, tell us about Mayawati? It has never been the case in UP that you can win with one community or two communities or thinking about adding just Muslims and Dalits or so on and so forth. So even in the heyday of SP and BSP competition, it was always the case that social communities that were broadly not aligned with any of these logics were voting for one party or the other. Right? And there were ways of sort of winning. So when we sort of think about the rise of Dalit politics or maybe a new rise of Dalit politics in UP, we have to figure out how does it fit into this picture of A into a larger electoral coalition that doesn't invite a backlash like what we're seeing in UP today and be something that has an understanding of politics that is not so onerous that it cannot drive or draw floating voters from other communities. Because ultimately those are the kinds of numbers that you're going to need to be electorally competitive. So I'll leave it there, thanks. Thank you so much, sir. That was an exceptional uh, discussion. Now I'll, I'll uh, uh, open the floor for questions and, and your responses. And in that line, I have a first question for uh, Professor uh, Desh Pandey. Uh, Ma'am, you talk about the changing voting patterns from 1971 to 2009. And, and in that aspect, I just wanted to know how do you see the role of Mandal Kamandal politics of 1990 when, when uh, the OBC politics and the Ram Mandal politics were at their peak? So, I mean, is there any role? And if there is any, the follow-up question is then, then are these considered to be fissures in Dalits as some grand single block or that's something natural for them? Uh, you want me to collect questions or you want me to uh, answer uh, straight away? Right? I can, uh, answer them right away, yeah. yeah. Okay. okay, no problem, yeah. yeah. You see, 90s uh, was a very uh, specific and peculiar moment. <laughs> Uh, the decade of 90s, uh, generally in Indian politics, but also more specifically in the politics of Uttar Pradesh, uh, where we see a lot of mobilization. And UP was at the center stage of that mobilization, of course. But we see it across the country in different regions also. It was a distinctive phase of mobilization of various groups. And also a kind of contestations, as you said, between Mandal and Kamandal, or these various, uh, we can say, frameworks uh, uh, in which politics is fought, usually the larger frameworks which were provided, they were very contentious frameworks, both of them. 
uh, and we see consolidation of the caste identity at that time uh, under the leadership of certain OBC communities. We also see emergence of Dalit politics at that time in UP under the leadership of Mayavati. I mean, there is a again there is a uh, there is a kind of difference between how we uh, see the OBC politics, rise of the Yadavs uh, in UP politics and rise of Mayavati and rise of Dalit politics in UP. Uh, and then perhaps the third angle is provided by the politics of Ma Mandir. So I, we can also imagine three kinds of contestations, especially uh, in, the, in the context of politics of UP uh, emerging at that time. Uh, and we see that there is a, again, the, those contestations became quite volatile so at some point of time, we see the Mandal discourse, if at all we reduce the Mandal discourse to OBC politics, winning the game at one point of time. And then we see the Dalit politics, which, is, which was a subtext, so to say, also a subtext of the Mandal politics. And Mandal politics, in a way, ideologically imagined that these two kind versions of politics would come together, really. But we see those opposed to each other in, in case of UP. And that winning the game at some point of time. But we also see gradual transfer, gradual shift of voters from, uh, let us say, the Mandal fold, the fold of these parties which, uh, which upheld Mandal discourse, to um, the Hindu fold, Hindutva fold, uh, the Hindutva ideology. Because 1996 elections and 1998 elections at the national level um, had this very clear shift of voters uh, towards the BJP and the OBC voters shifted uh, to BJP. So today with the hindsight, we can say that perhaps it was uh, this, the 90s politics ultimately culminated and politics takes its own sort of course of action and it moves very slowly that way. It's very contingent as we know. So in, in the 2017 moment, uh, it, it seems that from those three frameworks, the Hindutva framework or the Kamandal framework sort of becomes the more hegemonic, more dominant framework in UP. But otherwise, the 90s was full of these contestations, we can say. No, uh, I, I get that, ma'am. But I think uh, uh, that's a very uh, uh, interesting point to take the conversation forward. But my question is then that when we see that Kamandal, let's say if Kamandal is a point where we see that the Dalit votes are accumulating at, so can we really see Kamandal as a fissure in the, in the Dalit vote block? Or is that something natural for the Dalit vote? I mean, if, if we view from a very uh, uh, distance perspective, and do we see that uh, Dalits have been fissured with, with the onset of Kamandal politics? No, at one level, we can definitely say that. And if, to continue with the earlier point, uh, if these three kind of frameworks or uh, the Mandal and the Kamandal framework were clashing at that time with each other and the clash continues, uh, we see uh, this, uh, the Hindutva ideology and the rise of the Hindutva forces definitely affected the entire project of Mandal and also the Dalit sort of uh, agency and the assertion of Dalit agency. Uh, yeah. But at the same time, we must also take into account the fact that Dalit politics per se in UP under the leadership of earlier Kashiram, but more particularly Mayavati itself had its own limitations. And those limitations are not only about the leadership, typically how it is seen, not only in terms of the leadership, but also because of the fact that Dalit politics as uh, Professor Sarkar was also suggesting just now, it is very difficult in UP to win elections on the basis of any one community let us say. And uh, therefore, the Dalit politics always, in, in particular, Dalit politics always faces this compulsion of manufacturing of electoral majorities. And that also becomes a major limitation uh, for Dalit politics in addition to the fact that, so in a way, we can say it is a failure, the fissure is failure of both the Mandal project also. Yes. Because Mandal project had no capacity, so to say, to the Mandal project, the way it, in which it unveiled in the 90s, did not so show capacity to accommodate the Dalits along with the OBCs. You know, if atrocities against Dalits continued, not only in UP, but in other places also, it was very difficult for Dalits to go along with the OBCs 
at the local level or at the state level and that way perhaps we can say that the fissures were caused by all these factors all the three factors yeah that would be my take uh professor sarkar uh, uh professor deshpande leaves at a very interesting point and that point is about that in the mid 90s and during the 90s it was not really about uh, kashi ram mayawati mulayam singh yadav but a variety of factors now let me take this entire discussion to the idea of cult in 2014 and if i may request you to turn to your slide where you uh, 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 br- break the entire uh, voting uh, phase of up in seven phases right so that's a very interesting point if i may uh, uh, take you to that yes so as you say that in phase 6 uh, uh, they are the the strongholds of the bjp given its gorakhpur and varanasi i just wanted to know sir that uh, until the results were declared on 13th of march 2017 the bjp hadn't declared yogi aitnath as its its chief uh, chief ministerial candidate now in that light i just wanted to know that how do you see the politics of cult overshadowing uh, the politics of identity now do you really believe that uh, the question of polarization as you say that that the increased polarization took the vote for the bjp more or or is it just about the cult of the prime minister or of the the chief minister or the would be chief minister that that was the resulting factor why the bjp has been gaining lot many seats in these uh, phases let me answer in a slightly complex way right so um you know i don't i've been writing recently about how one of the terms that we should think about the current phase of politics in is through the through the idea of vishwas right the idea of belief in your leader and obviously that sounds a lot like a i mean in some sense uh, you know it's there's a there's a crosswalk between the idea of cultishness and belief it's not necessarily the same thing but but you know the the it it's it's plausible why it's important is that it changes the way in which demands are made in the system right so our typical view of democratic political accountability is that there are bottom up issues people vote for issues that they believe in when politicians don't deliver they throw them out they move them in a world in which you trust somebody to represent you and your group and your identity and everything about you you also let that person frame issues for you and so the argument is more about how do we get to that stage but uh, certainly that is a factor that that exists in national politics in india today it exists in up i mean we did hear yogi adityanath's name a lot even before he was you know explicitly given uh, the chief ministership and you know i i think we should understand this in a few different ways so one is that it is a fairly old technique to sort of bump up the religious polarization as a way of sort of cutting down on sort of caste divisions you know this is not this is something paul brass has written about this i mean you know this is a, this is something we've seen in the literature a lot so in that sense it's not extraordinary that a polarizing figure or a polarizing kind of politics might sort of um change you know sort of weaken certain kinds of caste divisions that exist between hindus but i think there's something else and i want to sort of go into a little bit of 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 political science here to sort of think about why it might be happening now when you actually look at candidate lists you will often see that each party is actually putting up somebody uh, some candidate from the same jati from the same caste group right so one of the very natural ways in which certain kinds of caste bonds are broken is they're broken completely at the local level so while there might be the superstructure that bjp represents this bsp represents that so on and so forth locally caste politics can still be and often is an orienting principle of life in up right so the two are not incompatible the third thing right when we think about um the rise of a certain kind of dalit politics and why it may or may not fail and this is a polit- uh, an argument that has been made most recently by francesca resungensenius but 
um, it's actually an old Ambedkar argument, right? Which is that reservation has a huge limitation, which is that you have to win the election in the constituency where the majority of the people are not Dalit. So to what extent can a Dalit politician or any, you know, any party that is representing Dalit issues actually win at the constituency level, given the kind of electoral architecture we have, as opposed to separate electorates, right? In which case you can have a politician representing Dalit voters. So, so what I would say is that it is true that there are certain facets of Yogi Adityanath and Modi that make this kind of uh, diminishing of Dalit versus non-Dalit more possible within, within Hindu politics and within BJP politics. But it is also true that there are structural and institutional factors in terms of the way that candidates are selected, in terms of how Dalit politicians have to appeal to non-Dalit voters that make it more likely that in the long term, this kind of politics cannot really persist. Right. Thank, thank you so much, sir. Uh, there's one last question that I have, and that's from uh, Nandini Goel from, from NLU Delhi. And, and her question is that, that how do you see the politics of, of Dalits sans BSP, right? When there is no BSP, when there is no Chandrasekhar Azad, how do you, can, can Dalits really trust the, the uh, non-Dalit parties to represent their causes. And this is despite the fact that we have reservation for SCs in, in various constituencies that only SC candidates can, uh, can contest from those constituencies. Um, is that for me or for? Either, either. Um, maybe let's all, let, let's both take a shot at this. So look, I mean, uh, the pattern of rising in politics as a community uh, still involves electoral politics, right? Do we believe the Yadavs would be as uh, the force that they are in UP and Bihar had there not been an electoral line? So in that sense, thinking about the rise of Dalit issues in a context in which the majority of the voters are non-Dalit, um, especially for big parties, it's hard for me to imagine that that is a good thing in 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 the medium to 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 long run for the Dalit communities in India. You know, I'll give one just very quick example. Uh, you know, I've done some work in Madhya Pradesh recently, and you know, Bundelkhand isn't just UP. Bundelkhand is also Madhya Pradesh, right? It's the other side of it. And there, there was this very very interesting, complicated problem that the BJP had tried to support some part of SCST Atrocities Act. And it got, a, it got a huge backlash from the upper caste and even the OBC communities in the area. And eventually, as we all know, they, back, they basically backtracked. This shows the dynamics of trying to appeal to Dalit issues if you are a, 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 a mainstream party. And, and I think that it, is, it will still take a while for these mainstream political actors to be able to um, appeal to caste-wise issues and Dalit issues um, or figure out how to solve that problem. Given that you have an electorate that, you know, let's not, let's not pretend here, right? We can talk about politicians playing all kinds of colors, but on the ground, life is still not very good for Dalits in India, right? And there is a lot of, you know, sort of caste hegemony on the ground. And it's very, very hard to break that, right? If you're, if you're seeking those. Uh, Professor Deshpande? Yeah, yeah. No, no the, the very first thing uh, I would like to share with Nandini uh, is that uh, uh, although certain parties uh, and very rightfully claim uh, to represent the Dalit interests, uh, Dalit voters have always voted for the so-called non-Dalit political parties as well. Uh, and that's why I said that uh, earlier, if it was the Congress, now uh, a sizable chunk of the Dalit voters have also been voting for the BJP. And I'll give you an example from uh, Maharashtra uh, where uh, the intra-Dalit divisions uh, operate also as very significant divisions. And that is not confined to Maharashtra only, but uh, also in UP, also at other places, uh, the intra-Dalit um, divisions also operate in politics. 
and as a result of which those dalits particularly in maharashtra you know uh, you might know that the buddhist dalit identity uh, is politically a more assertive identity um, but there has been an unfortunate division between the hindu dalits and the buddhist dalits and they have been typically voting for different political parties uh, and if you look at again maharashtra's case Uh, the rpi in maharashtra which claims to represent the dalits of maharashtra um, is not a very popular party even among the dalit voters um, if you consider the percentage of votes and the support that they get so in that sense uh, this uh, th this poses a very important puzzle that uh, the, the the dalit parties so to say uh, need to address whether they are really uh, able to represent uh, the the entire dalit community uh, especially after this rise of the single caste identity in the post mandal phase so within dalits then every caste demands certain kind of quota uh, for itself the famous mala madiga debate also you must be aware of that so in that sense it becomes a huge challenge uh, to 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 talk about dalit interests and at the moment unfortunately again the the parties that claim to represent the dalit interests are not able to address this challenge uh, successfully or effectively uh, and that i see as a very important issue and um, that we need to discuss but yes dalits have been voting for the non dalit political parties and um, that again will have significant implications on the nature of dalit politics that we would have Absolutely. So, thank you so much, ma'am and sir. It was an exceptional discussion, and I'm sure that the points that you've raised uh, leave our audience with a considerable food for thought for 2022. And uh, we look forward to having you with us soon before 2022. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Anand. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks, Professor Sarkar. Thank you, Professor Jashwande. Bye.